What's up, everyone? It's George from Crypto Potato. Today, we're here with Anthony Diorio. Anthony is one of the co-founders of Ethereum, and he's also the CEO and founder of crypto infrastructure provider Decentral. Today, we talk about some interesting facts of Ethereum's past, how the second largest cryptocurrency was born by its five co-founders, including Vitalik Buterin and Charles Hoskinson. We also discussed whether ETH can surpass Bitcoin as the primary cryptocurrency, and of course, the recent reports of Anthony leaving the industry. As always, make sure to hit the like button if you enjoy the video, subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you don't miss on any new episodes in the future. Hey Anthony, thanks so much for agreeing to do this, man. It's awesome. Good to be here with you. Okay. Uh, so let's just dive right into it. You're one of the co-founders of Ethereum, as well as the CEO and the founder of uh, Decentral. But can you take us back a little bit and tell me more about yourself and what was life like before crypto? Like, what were you doing before that? Oh, I, I was into a number of things before that. So I'll go right back to uh, early in my life. Um, uh, computers were the, the dominant thing in my childhood. Uh, I was born in the mid-70s and uh, in the... In the early 80s, uh, my dad brought home a, an IBM PC Junior. It was a, kind of the start of, of uh, personal computing age was around that time. And uh, there was something that I was just enthralled with. And over the next number of years, building computers and going to computer camp and just just through my whole life, pretty much computers have been, and I've been known as the computer guy in the family. So uh, my, uh, my first business was in the early 90s, uh, building websites, HTML1. Me and my brother had a web design company right when the the internet was kicking off for at least uh, in the very early 90s. Um, I went to school for business. I didn't do uh, uh, computers. I went for, um, my dad was an entrepreneur. My dad's a, an inventor, problem solver. And uh, I followed, followed his steps in, in taking business. I didn't really want to get into, a, do, do a computer. Um, I never really wanted to be a, a developer. I wanted to be more of a, a creator and a, an entrepreneur. So I uh, went to school for business, graduated in, in the, in the late 90s and uh, went to work in the 2000s for my uh, family business, which was sliding patio door manufacturing. My, my dad and his brothers had a company and uh, had about hundred employees and uh, learned a lot more on the entrepreneurial side there and, and the hiring side and um, just just in manufacturing, all kinds of different things there, working in the office and doing a ton, all these types of different things there. And uh, in 2008, he sold the business and I had an opportunity to do something. Uh, I didn't want to work with the, the same guys that were buying it. And so he said, what do, you, what do you want to do now? And I thought about it and, and I wanted to do something technology oriented and something green focused. And uh, a family friend was into geothermal drilling and I ended up buying a drill um, uh, from Italy. It was this massive, uh, big drilling rig and proceeded to do some Ikea buildings in, in, uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, Basically, with the geothermal drilling, you use zero temperature to heat and cool buildings. And that's what uh, with the drilling company is what I did and, and did that for a few years. And uh, government, uh, as they tend to do, got in the way. I brought the drill to Canada and uh, it was uh, over the next couple of years, there were a lot of slowdowns that were instituted by, by the government of a lot of red tape that made the projects just not quite feasible anymore because they would really delay construction of buildings. So in 2011, um, I ended up leasing out the drill to another drilling company and, uh, and didn't do that anymore. And at the same time, I had some properties. So I had some rental properties that uh, from 2005 to 2011. And in 2011, 2010, I started studying a lot on, on economics and, and studying after the housing crisis, what had happened there. Right. Uh, my brother got me interested in money and said, hey, not interested in money in terms of, in terms of money itself, but the history of money. And I really started delving into the history of money and, and I learned a lot about the different types of economics and the Austrian school of economics was something that I was quite intrigued with. Um, and the idea of, uh, of, of sound money uh, was something that I researched and studied. And uh, in, in 2012, uh, I was, uh, well, 2011 actually, I, I sold my properties and thinking that there was gonna be a housing issue in Canada, which is where I'm from. And uh, had over the maybe six year period had amassed uh, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars from the, the sale of the property. And I dabbled in gold and silver for a bit. And in 2012, I came across Bitcoin. And uh, always someone that never liked school that never liked being told what to do. Uh, the idea of freedom was something that was always been really important to me. And 
after studying economics and thinking, okay, this is great. This is the situation we're in right now. We've got these booms and bust cycles that happen and government involvement with in, in inflation. It's like, it's like, well, what do we do about that? And, and that's when I heard about Bitcoin and I understood from my, from my background, you know, decentralized networks and I uh, was, was, was involved in the, the Napster days back in the day and, and just file sharing and peer to peer systems. And um, it just was a, 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 I saw as a tool to empower people to be in control of their, their lives or digital lives. And in 2012, I just became, a, a, just, just dove deep in Bitcoin and spent weeks without sleeping and just, just, just really digging into it. And when I looked for a community out there, there wasn't one in Toronto. So I started it. I started the Toronto Bitcoin meetup group in 2012, Vitalik Buterin, uh, the, uh, the idea creator behind Ethereum was at my first meetup and that's how I got to know him. Um, so he was from Toronto and, um, and right away I started thinking about the, the value I could bring to the industry because when the internet started out, I was really going, you know, before university, I just wasn't, uh, it wasn't the time of my life that I could really utilize the surge of the internet back in the day, but I thought this was just a perfect storm for me to, uh, to get involved and build the community out and start, start building out uh, value in, in, and, uh, a gentleman in the U S I connected with and. Uh, he was out of New Jersey, and him and I proceeded to to create a, a Bitcoin gambling site back in 2012. And uh, within a few months, we we sold it um, to the early 2013. Did you sell it for cash? For Bitcoin? No, I sold it for Bitcoin, and this was when Bitcoin was was at hundred dollars. So uh, I also had purchased uh, an amount of Bitcoin uh, for eight thousand dollars. I put down when it was around ten bucks as well. Was this so, your first investment in Bitcoin? Yeah, yeah, it was in 2012, but it was around 10 bucks. Um, so I put $8,000 in at the time then. And then between the sale of the company and that, my investments, I had a few million dollars within a few months because uh, the price went up to $1,200, but then it came back down. That was through the whole Mt. Gox situation. And um, from, from uh, my partner, I got back together again, the developer partner that I connected with, and we, we started building wallets. And we understood that the wallets are really the interfaces that were needed to, to manage and move value, just like the browser is for the internet to, to manage and move information. So in, in early 2013, we started building wallets. And then near the end of the year, we launched a product called CryptoKit. And uh, CryptoKit was a Chrome extension Bitcoin wallet. And, uh, and right when we launched it, it was pretty much the same time that Vitalik showed me the white paper for, for Ethereum. It was November 2013. And uh, I showed it to my friend, Charles Hoskinson. Um, and then five How of us- How did you guys uh, meet? Uh, I met Charles, I met Charles. I had started the Bitcoin Alliance of Canada, which was a national nonprofit organization. So I started with, with the meetup group. And then I, I set up a national organization to help promote Bitcoin and help work with the media. And, and through that, uh, Charles had been working on the Bitcoin education project and working with the, the Bitcoin Foundation. So we've been connected um, because we've been doing some similar work, me in Canada, uh, him uh, with the foundation. And, um, and we just, we connected and we clicked. And this was before, you know, for a number of months before, while I was building out the wallets, uh, uh, we, we had uh, stayed in steady co communication. And uh, Vitalik also was helping with, with CryptoKit. He was uh, kind of doing some work for the team as well on that. And I got to know Vitalik as he was traveling the world uh, he had dropped to the university at that time in 2012 and was, was going around the world working and just seeing how other Bitcoin projects were, were evolving and MasterCoin and uh, BitShares and uh, Color Coins at the time. And uh, he, he got the concept and an idea for uh, you know, the struggles that were happening on Bitcoin. Uh, he he uh, conceived the idea of a separate blockchain with a smart contract uh, platform and uh, showed it to me and um, you know, along with uh, Mihai Alize, who was uh, his partner on Bitcoin Magazine, and uh, Amir Chetri, who uh, he had uh, got to know from the Color Coins project, uh, and myself and Charles and Vitalik, who we became the, the five founders of, of the project. And the funding came from me uh, and, and what I had uh, uh, been able to do with the, with the sale of the company and with my Bitcoin um, purchases early on. We set up a, a, in Toronto. I, I was just at the same time. This was a January 1st, 2014, um, I had just uh, opened up uh, Bitcoin Decentral, which was a physical location in Toronto. And uh, it just coincided with the same time we were starting Ethereum. So that became the first home of Ethereum and hired the lawyers, hired the uh, HR team and started 
started build, building things out of out of trawl for Ethereum, but uh, it was re it was realized that it wasn't very good on the um, the regulatory side in Canada. There was just too much uncertainty there, so we decided to set up in Switzerland, and that became the main the main hub for Ethereum over in Switzerland. And uh, we grew the team, added three other founders: uh, Joseph Rubin, uh, uh, Jeffrey Wilkie, and Gavin Wood. And uh, did the crowd sales later on in 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 2014 and raised uh, 18 million dollars. It was uh, 9,000 participants from all around the world uh, uh, gave us that to, to build out the project, and that's what we did. And a year later, the project launched, and uh, I left Ethereum in 2015. And that's kind of a, a very very long winded uh, answer to your question, but uh, that kind of takes us up to the. Uh, uh, a time where, where I left Ethereum in 2015 to continue building wallets. And, and that's what I've been, been really doing there since, is building the interfaces, tools, the cloud the infrastructure, all, everything needed to, to enable people to be in control of their digital lives. Their money, communication, and identity is something that I believe should be held by the, the individual and not be monetized, or at least not uh, in the same business models that, that exist today. So, and that's what I've been building with Decentral and, and Jax literally uh, since then. So it sounds like you're in the business of identifying problems and then finding the solutions for them pretty much. That's what I say is my greatest skill is problem solving. And um, I have models to do that. I've developed frameworks and I've got some papers coming out uh, in the future. That's what Decentral is all about, right? Building infrastructure and... Yeah, it's, a, it's everything that the internet needed to get off the ground. The decentralized internet needed the equivalent thing. So the browser is the wallet, okay. right? The, the, um, the cloud services, is the infrastructure to connect to all the different uh, protocols, right. right? So that's all the blockchain as a service, and that's what's needed for that. That runs the back end of Jax. Is all of our infrastructure that we built personally, that, we, that our teams built uh, from scratch. Yeah. We've uh, had eight years, nine years of trial and error to get where we are right now, which is very scalable and very interoperable infrastructure for the twelve chains that we support. Um, so that's something that uh, has been a, a um, you know, a lot of we don't use anybody else's services. Everything is 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 is, is our own in-house uh, stuff that we built, and then also the partnerships and the which is akin to the app store, and that's how people can purchase and trade uh, in Jax Liberty via our partners. So we don't hold customer funds. We're a non-custodial wallet, um, and we don't actually do exchange services. We have partners that facilitate and take care of all of that, and that enables us to be a global product because we're not holding customer funds. We're not regulated um, because we're not we're, we're non-custodial. And we don't run trading services. So we, we have a global reach with users in 220 plus countries. Right. And that's always been our model is to be a global product. Whereas a lot of companies are kind of stuck within their borders and what it is they're doing because of the regulatory and compliance that they need to deal with. And for us, uh, uh, we've, we've set it up in a way that uh, aligns with the ethos of, of cryptocurrency, which is never wanting to hold or have access to customer funds. Um, and, and I've done it along the way without ever taking user, sorry, taking investor money. Everything's been funded myself and uh, that's a, an important thing to me because I think a lot of the business models and the way the, the tech industry works is you get investors, investors fund companies, you've got to continue to return your profits to the investors on a month after month. Uh, you know, there's a lot of squeezing that happens there in terms of how do we maximize our profits and revenue and a lot of times it's at the expense of, of, of the planet or at the expense of other people and and um, a lot of the models I, I find are deficient in tech, like uh, we don't ever collect user information. So uh, there's, no, there's no email even required to use Jax, right? So identity communication and money, I think should be in the hands of the individual and not used as business models. And it's led to a lot of issues as we've seen with, with the business models of collecting user information and the troubles that that, that that can have. And then also advertising models are also a big issue that I see and having to appease advertisers by getting eyeballs on their products, which leads to a lot of the clickbaity articles out there. And, and just a lot of, the, I believe the fake news and, and a lot of the misinformation that, that the internet, that's very rampant on the internet because that's what spreads rapidly is, is misinformation and, and news that, that kind of tries to um, get people's attention and uh, ties to their heartstrings. And it leads to a very divisive world, I believe in a very tribal, tribal world. And, and uh, the us versus them mentalities, I think, are, are because of these business models. And that's I'm, I'm a firm believer of that, and that's why I don't and I haven't used those models. Uh, so for the last eight years, we just we just don't do that, and um, uh, because of the the issues that arise from from those business models, and I think there's a better way to do things. And for us, it's partnerships, right. and we, we 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 do well when our partners do well. And that's the model that we've always used. Can I take you back a little bit? 
um, because I entered the space uh, around 2017, the beginning of 2017. And the first thing that I started reading about was obviously Bitcoin. But right after that, I started reading about Ethereum and you guys as the founders of Ethereum. So I started researching about who you are. And I think that a lot of people coming into the space who are really looking to get into the space, look at you as kind of those OGs who, thanks to whom everything we do right now is possible. You know, Ethereum is a huge part of the entire industry right now. Uh, so is Bitcoin. Um, but can you tell me what was it like working with those guys? Because, you know, that Gavin Wood went on to found Polkadot, uh, Charles Hoskinson is with Cardano, Joseph Lubin is with Consensus and so forth. All those powerful individuals behind these powerful companies such as yourself and Vitalik Buterin. How was it like when you first got together and how, how, how is it like working with those guys? It was, it was an interesting experience. Ethereum was such a massive opportunity that it wasn't the typical business I would be setting up, which is I learned a long time ago I didn't want partners uh, in, in, in business. It just I've, I've always felt that the um, I would work best, uh, you know, being the the vision and then hiring people to carry out things as needed, and it enabled me to work very fast and move quickly with things. Um, but that was such an interesting opportunity that I didn't, you know, I didn't have that choice then, and, and it was such a, a fast moving, fast paced growth uh, from 2013 the end there to 2014 when we were setting everything up. Uh, it was a very it was a, it was a whirlwind. It was uh, November, uh, end of November 2000. 13, uh, the white paper uh, was shared around um, in, in, in December 2013, the five of us got together as the founders. Um, we started setting up Skype groups and started just adding people in and just became such a, a global, very quickly a global phenomenon with, uh, with, with meetup groups spreading all around the world and in a real fast time in less than, was it maybe eight months, we had done the crowd sale and started the development work. And it was, you know, a, a, a challenge. It was, it was five founders uh, who really didn't know each other uh, in, a, in a, like well enough to be forming a company. Um, but you had uh, extremely intelligent people there. You had Charles Hoskinson, uh, uh, a whiz kid. Uh, he was only what, 25 at the time. Um, there you had Vitalik and Mihai that were in their, their teens. Um, you had myself and, and uh, Amir, kind of the older, the older ones there. Uh, for the first five and then there was a uh, you know it ended up expanding because there was a um you know and it wasn't something that i was initially for but the thinking was that we needed some developers on the team and uh, i always thought we could hire the developers but it was uh, set up in a way that we added uh, joseph rubin and he was visiting toronto when i launched in central and he happened to just show up uh, uh, at, at, he was visiting his parents over Christmas, I think it was, and uh, and he showed up to the meetup, and and we we had a good connection. Or he did with with me and Vitalik, and we invited him to Miami for the conference when we announced it. And he ended up joining the team, and he was able to do quite a bit of the funding as well, leading up to the crowd sale, which was great because it was a long period of time there where we had to make sure that we were compliant and doing things uh, that that in the proper fashion. So it was a struggle. Just we had eight people uh, that. Uh, um, most in different countries and didn't really know each other and uh, decisions were hard to come by and you had you had uh, developers and you had some business people and trying to get everything coordinated um, developers wanted to really push to get the product out and, and proof of concepts and get things really moving quickly but there were and get the crowd sale to get the funding done and, and the things we needed to do but uh, there was also some of the regulatory stuff that needed to be considered and there was there was a lot of butting ahead and a lot of tough tough decisions uh, that, that couldn't get made and eventually there was a time uh, before the crowd sale where um, there was, I, I call it, it was a, a takeover by the developers um, that, that basically was uh, the, the decisions aren't being made here. We, we, we need to do these things and um, we got to get moving. And um, they, they wanted to oust some people from the team and uh, ended up Charles and Amir uh, were two that were, that, 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 that happened to. And uh, um, uh, even Joseph and myself, I think we saw the long-term writings on the wall of where things were heading. It was turning into a full development focus, and uh, we had already put our money in. <laughs> and uh, it uh, it ended up over time. Uh, Joseph uh, it, uh, left to do consensus, and, and I left to continue to do decentral. But we were the stewards of the approach to getting things underway, and 
Um, a lot of the, the, the decision making uh, leading up to 2015 was 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 done by the core eight, uh, the team, and and then uh, Vitalik's been stewarding it uh, it since. Well, as you mentioned, some of the other guys have uh, have gone off, and you know it was it was it was it was tough, but I wouldn't have changed anything. Uh, now it, it's it's it was I feel so grateful to be involved in something that's that's had the magnitude that it has, and to work with those people. And I mean, there were really tough times and, and times where. You know, we were we were pulling each other's hair out and things like that. It just wasn't, you know, it was it was a, a lot of fun, a lot of struggle. But that's just what makes things, and, and it happens like that. So, uh, thankfully for me, after that, um, I got went back to not not having partners, and uh, that's how it's been for me since. And do you see a future where Ethereum overtakes Bitcoin as the primary cryptocurrency? I th I personally think it'll happen. Um, it's just I have a just that's just what I sense from the, what's being built on top of Ethereum and, and how the the growth has been there. Um, that's what I anticipate. I don't know if I'm going to be right or wrong with that, but I but I do see it. And who knows when it when it when or if it'll happen? But uh, if I had to to say one way or the other, I would think it would happen. Okay. Well, it's safe to say that your journey in crypto is is quite fascinating. So we arrive uh, today. Uh, a couple of weeks back, we saw some reports about you leaving the space. Uh, but I don't know, it felt like it came across kind of wrong. So can you please share yeah, some details um, about it, it was a all of it, like what are your sure. current plans, what are your future plans, and what's all that with you living in crypto? I'd like to say that, the, you know, I'm not a black or white person. There's a lot of middle ground, and, and I can see different perspectives of things. And, uh, you know, a lot of the world, I think, is, is, is black and white. And, uh, um, and there, were, there were a number of reasons why I decided that I want to do something else and do something different. And I'll always have the tools in my tool belt for with blockchain and with crypto, but I want to solve problems and I want to solve some larger world problems. And I want to take the formulas that I developed to do that. And it's not be all, the be all and end all is not just crypto and, and blockchain. So, um, and there's also, you know, there's a number of, there's other factors as well. It's a, it's a risky space to be in. Um, Okay. It's the uh, security wise, uh, there's, there's just, even with the products that we develop, we don't hold people's funds because we're non-custodial, but there's still certain attack vectors that could happen. The last thing I'd want would be a life-changing moment uh, where something would happen with the customer funds or something that, that, that would be an issue. And, and it's just, for me, I, I feel it's a, it, I, I have a, you know, over the last couple of years, I've tried to figure out what it is I really want to be doing with my life. And it's, I, I came to the conclusion that um, I'm, I'm very good at problem solving and I'd like to, to, to do things that make people happy and I'm going to dedicate my life to be in service to the world and to use my problem solving capabilities to solve, solve big problems. So my what, my why, and my how is what is something that I really, as I shifted away from, you know, always that freedom mentality and more and more freedom. How could I have more and more freedom? And I was realizing the more freedom I got, actually, the less freedom I had. Okay. So I have, you know, security people and and like, is that really the way I want to live my life? And and so it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but uh, I think things are a double-edged sword. And, um, and you know, there's 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 good reasons to have your money in someone else's hands sometimes, and it's good reason to have it in your own hands sometimes. But uh, it's not black and white. And and I felt that I could. Uh, my goal is to sell the company. What I built over the last eight years, we built all the tools, all the interfaces, everything needed to have a product that's that that. Uh, can be extremely valuable for, for a number of different entities that might want to uh, continue down the crypto path and utilize our interfaces, our, our, our infrastructure, and our partnerships in a way that uh, they could, that company can enter the space or take over what we've done and continue with the vision that I have, which is hardware products and a bunch of, a ton of other things that I've got on the roadmaps that I've always thought would, would continue to empower people to be in control of their lives. And, you know, nodes at home that people can run on their own very easily so that they're, they're empowered to send transactions to networks without even needing our infrastructure. It's, it's further ways to help to create decentralization. So um, the idea is to, is to uh, sell the company, uh, even continue on potentially in some type of role as a vision guide or, or something in, in, in a new entity or, or with, with a company that, that, that I would align with well, that I feel has an opportunity to add value to my company and together create something really special and, and enter, enter the, the crypto space or, or just take what we built because it is everything that's needed uh, for anybody that wants to build anything or enterprise services for 
for, for companies that want to build on, on our technology. Um, that's what our infrastructure is. It's, it's, it's getting ready for enterprise grade services is something that we've been building. So there's a lot of value there. And, and I, wanna, I want to, to work on serving and, and solving problems and that aren't necessarily uh, related to, to profit motives down the road. Um, I think sometimes there's a tie in where, uh, again, the, the idea of, of maximizing profits and, and being the thought of someone who's, you know, if I can use my money to give back and I'm doing it because I really want to serve the world and, and help to, to do things, if I can do it in a way where I'm using my money to do it is, is the way that I'd like to do it. And I don't want to ask anybody ever for money. So the idea here is to maximize what I built, take that, and then be able to, 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 to give that back as I'm working to try to change the incentive structures of the world from uh, the month after month shareholder returns to maximizing impact. Okay. And if we can get everybody focused on, 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 on companies and brands, figuring out how to serve the most amount of people, I believe that's how they're going to get their, their returns. And in a better fashion, with better, with better business models, and better business models that serve more stakeholders and don't exclude uh, people, which is what kind of happens now. I believe there's a deficiency in business models that lead to, to share stakeholders not always being all stakeholders being uh, having winning situations. And the closer we can get to the world being a stakeholder and understanding that the more we can serve as many people as possible, I believe that's how you're going to get the, the respect and recognition as a company, uh, as an icon, as somebody that can 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 create movements of of, of impact. And that's what I want to do. I want to help facilitate movements of people understanding that the more they do good for others, the more they're going to going to get for themselves. Right. And that's sure. where I want to focus my attention in the future. So to shatter every possible misunderstanding on this, you're not leaving the industry because you've lost faith in it. You're leaving no, it because you want to explore other, other avenues. And, uh, yeah, I, I, it'll always be a part of me. And when it makes sense to solve a problem with it, then by all means. But there's a lot of problems that, 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 that just need some better problem solving and don't necessarily blockchain is not the answer or crypto is not the answer. And, um, I think there's also a, a large number of people in the ecosystem now. I've seen it grow in the last 10 years. And it, there's some really good stewards now that are taking this on. And, and I feel, you know, I, I want to I do the next thing for me. And it's not as sexy for me anymore. It's not that I've lost, you know, it's, 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 it's very valuable. And I've been an advocate for empowerment and, and people being in control of their digital lives. And I'm going to continue to focus on those, those, those new models that will help that exist in the future. But um, I think there's greater things that I can be that I want to work on uh, using the models to solve problems. And I believe it's a, it, the model I have is it's a general problem solving formula. It can basically take any problem that puts it through my processes, principles, and tools to come up with solutions that is creating as many wins for as many stakeholders as possible. That's really my thing. And it's the idea to try to get up to 100% of the stakeholders and turn the world as a stakeholder into what you're doing so that everybody is, is, is on board and then movements are created because everybody is realizing the more that they're having a win and the more they're helping out others, the more the world is getting better, the more their life is getting better. And I want to help be a leader and I want to help facilitate. So problem solving and leadership are two things I think is, is, is something that I want to be, uh, I want to, to focus on. And I think that the, the world needs more problem solvers and leaders. And uh, we need to get to, to, the, to the youth as well on, on how to become leaders and how to solve problems. And I want to be the catalyst that, 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 that does that. And that's where I, I want to focus my attention. Right. And I would like to ask you one more question, since you've obviously built important things, companies in our industry, if you would have one advice, because we can see that in the past couple of years, a lot of people are coming into crypto, uh, not just for speculative purposes, like investing in cryptocurrencies, but actually building, building apps, building infrastructure and making crypto more accessible. What will your what would your best advice be to those who are just now getting into crypto? Uh, learn as much as build. possible. Yeah, people getting in, uh, educate yourselves as much as possible. Find trusted sources that can help expedite your knowledge. Um, a lot of people don't know where to begin and where to start. Um, it's the, the internet's a very interesting place, and it's hard to 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 get trustworthy um, uh, trustworthy sources to really learn. I, I think getting out and meeting people. There's a ton of meetup groups around the world. Uh, connecting with others. Uh, if you want to start a business, uh, a good way to do that is 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 meet with others that are very um, that are they're also enthused by by the space as well. And and uh, and if, if 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 you don't even have any other areas, maybe think of starting one. It's just it's just how can you educate yourself as much as possible, learn as much as possible. Um, in, there's a lot out there to do that. 
and it's very difficult sometimes. So if, if you are passionate about it, so just 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 learn as much as possible, connect with as many people as possible, reach out to as many people as possible, and uh, and then figure out uh, where your value sits and what it is you want to do to create uh, a company or to create value in the space. And what is it you're good at that can be translated into something in, in the space if that's something that, that that someone wants to do. Well, Anthony, I think that sums it up. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Can you tell us where we can find you? Like our, where can our audience find you? Social channel? Yeah, it's, it's a little challenging. Uh, Twitter is probably the best way for me. I don't do much on social media, um, but uh, with what I'm doing in the future, there will be a lot more stuff coming on, on Twitter. So it's Diorio Anthony. It's D-I-I-O-R-I-O-A-N-T-H-O-N-Y. And that's, that's probably the best way to connect with me there. Okay. Well, once again, thank you so much for agreeing to this. It was a blast. My pleasure, George. Thanks for having me. Good chatting with you.